Welcome. Time for us to start talking about preaching, and that really is one of my favorite subjects. So I'm excited to talk with you a little bit about that over the next few weeks as we think about what preaching is all about and how to do it very, very well. Now, as I said, this is one of the areas in which we're going to have to work together because we're working across cultures. And there are some things about preaching in the United States that I hope will transfer over to preaching in Southern Africa. But I'm going to have to learn with you on that. I think there are principles about Christian preaching that sort of walk through uh, all cultures and all ages, but again, we'll work together on how some of this works for you. So today we launch into it. Preaching has really been at the heart of what I've been doing for the last 30 years. And when I started preaching, I really fell in love with the process of preaching and the study, the preparation for preaching, and I've enjoyed it. At times it's been a struggle, and I've preached some sermons that I look back on and think, wow, that really wasn't the best that I could have done. And I, I, I want to go back and redo it. Of course, you can't do that. In preaching, once it's done, it's done. It's out there. <clears throat> but, but it is a joy to be able to share insights from God's Word with God's people. So I love what I do. And as we walk through this together, I hope it shows. And I hope that you'll feel more confident about your ability and, and your plan to go up and stand in front of people and talk about God and the message of Jesus. Let's note at the out, uh, outset of all this that the technical term for the study of preaching is homiletics, okay? And we hear that word thrown around a lot, and it's the title of lots of different books, but it's really just the study of preaching. So we're going to use that in some ways interchangeably, homiletics as the study of preaching, but when you hear me talk about it, just know we're talking about preaching. What we, did, what we do need to know is that preaching really is needed. And so when we think about preaching, we need to look at a place like Romans chapter 10, verse 14, that without preaching, people are not going to know about the gospel. So let me turn to it. This is what Paul says. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? How are they going to call on Jesus if they don't believe in him? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? The whole point there is they can't call on Jesus if they don't believe in him. They can't believe in him if they haven't heard. And how are they going to hear unless there are preachers? And so really for me, this is one of the things that has made Zimbabwe Christian College and now Central Africa Christian College important to me is that you know, we don't need to send missionaries to Zimbabwe. What we need to do is to help train preachers. And you are going to do that. And there's been many who've gone before you who have been great preachers in Zimbabwe and beyond in Southern Africa as a result of the college. So I'm thankful to, to partner with you in all this and thankful for the opportunity to speak with you about preaching. Now, as we get started, we need to think a little bit about what our task is. And with any job, we need to think about what we've been called to do. So we're going to think about that today to give an overview. This really is a map of the task of preaching. That's what I want us to think about today. And from this point forward, we'll jump down into some of those specifics and think specifically about what you do to introduce a sermon, to form an outline, all those things. But today we're going to give an overview. And again, we'll think through, maybe you can help me with some of the challenges of speaking cross-culturally. So what is biblical preaching? That's what I want us to start with, thinking about the definition of what we're trying to do. So here we go, the definition. Preaching is the proclamation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. At its heart, preaching is talking about Jesus. Now, we're delving into what the gospel is all about, that it's more than just you need to be saved and more than just here's how to find salvation. It really is the good news of what God has done in Jesus. And biblical preaching, to take that a step further, and that's really what we're into, is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus based in the text of the Bible. So our preaching is going to always be based in what does scripture have to say. So we're going to think about how do we go from the text of the Bible to our listeners? How do we move from the one to the other? This is not about what James Jones thinks about the gospel. This is what does scripture actually say about the gospel and how do we communicate that well to the people who are going to listen? So we're going to have a class session devoted to 
the components that we're going to talk about today, but I want to introduce them and get us started in some of these basic things about the overview of the preaching process. So it begins with prayer. The whole process, not just the beginning, but the whole process of preaching should be bathed in prayer. We should pray all the way through this, whether we're thinking about what am I going to preach about today? What text am I going to use? Or how do I put this series together? Or how do I apply this to the lives of the listeners? All that should be bathed in prayer. Now, I think if you're like me, and I have to be honest with you, there have been times when I haven't done this as well as I should. When I haven't bathed the process in prayer, when I haven't prayed for the people I'm going to be preaching to. So, you know, this is an area where most of us can say, I need to do better. And whether it's preaching or teaching or ministry and anything else, am I praying for God to be at work in me? So let's start with that. Let's pray. Let's be sure we're praying over what we're preaching about. And then we jump into study. And I call this study number one because we're going to come back to study. And there's sort of two levels at which we're going to study. And we're going to study about the people that we're, we're going to preach to, and we're going to study about Scripture. So let's break this down. First of all, we're going to study Scripture. You and I need to be continual students of Scripture. We're looking at Colossians in this class, but we're going to be looking at lots of different passages over the course of our careers, right? I've preached well over a thousand different sermons, and, and I've looked at passages from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Gospels, the letters, prophecy, the law, the history in the Old Testament, all those things. So we want to be students of the Bible. That means we want to do it personally. So we're going to be students of the Bible devotionally. And for me, what that means is that every morning when I come to my office and I'm here in my office at my desk, I'm going to spend some time reading God's Word. Now, I'm not reading it just for the sake of what will I preach next, but I'm reading it so that it speaks to me. Because first and foremost, I want to be a student of the Bible. I want the Bible to form who I am through the power of God at work in His Word. Now, what I found is that over the years, as I've studied God's Word personally, it sometimes speaks to me homiletically. What I mean by that is I may be reading through 1 John, and in fact, I did that. And then it wasn't long before I thought, you know, here's a way to preach this just as a part of my reading. I wasn't reading for what's my next sermon about, but because I was reading God's Word, it spoke to me in a particular way and raised some issues that I thought needed to be addressed in my preaching. So I think that's a natural thing. But because we're students of the Bible, because we're allowing God's Word to speak to us, then it may speak to us homiletically as well as personally. But we don't just read scripture, we read the culture. Now, what is authoritative in our lives? What is normative for us? The Bible, right? I mean, that's God's word to us. That's what we believe. We believe it is the inspired word of God. We believe it's our rule of faith and practice. And so we're going to study that first. That speaks into everything else. But if we're going to be good preachers, then we also need to know what's going on around us and what people are thinking about in the culture. And so Karl Barth famously said, keep the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And that's not because the newspaper or any media, social media, news media is authoritative to us. We don't just mimic the culture, but what we do have to know is what is affecting people and the culture is affecting people. Then we take scripture and say, how does that speak into the lives of the people around us? So the Bible's authoritative but we've got to know what's going on in the culture if we're going to be good preachers. And we also need to study theologians and biblical scholars. Now, are their works any more authoritative than what we're doing? Well, not necessarily, but what we can do is learn from their insights. And if we see they're being faithful to Scripture, people who study Scripture as well, then they may give us insight that we don't find anywhere else, right? Because they've studied it more than we have. Now, you're willing to listen to me talk about Colossians, and I've studied it, but here's what you need to know. I'm not a New Testament scholar. I'm a preacher. I've spent my life preaching, and I've certainly preached a good bit on the book of Colossians, but there are people who are better scholars than I am about the book of Colossians. Well, guess what? As I've prepared these lessons, I've been studying those people, and it's good for us to study those biblical scholars and theologians.
For example, the lectures and writings of N.T. Wright, sometimes called Tom Wright, he's a biblical New Testament scholar, reminded me of the importance of Colossians 1, 15 through 20, which is why I preached a series of lessons on the book of Colossians in the church that I serve. And then that became a basis for this course. I began to think, okay, this is a place for students to start thinking about really who Jesus is and preaching on that. So it was really the, the work of a New Testament scholar that led me to preach on this text, which led me to then work with you on this. So you can see the reading, the study of what biblical scholars are saying can influence what we end up doing in our ministry. So prayer and then study of scripture, study of culture, study of theologians and biblical scholars. And then the next step is forming the series. The reading that we do, whether it's 1 John, like I mentioned, or Colossians, as in this set of lessons, that sometimes just gives us the, the very kernel or the, the seed of an idea. It may be a spark of what a sermon or a series will later become. And so we have to take that and then do the really hard work of putting a series of lessons together. Now, we'll talk about this as we, we discuss series later, but I believe that series preaching is more powerful than one lesson. When we preach a series of lessons, whether it's through a text of scripture or on a particular topic, we can dive in a little deeper and give people more. So I almost always am preaching in a series. Now, something sparks that series. But then I go from there, as I said, to do the hard work. Sometimes the easy work is getting the idea for a series, and the hard work is, okay, how does this work into four or six or eight sermons, and how do they fit together? Uh, you're not going to be doing that alone. We're, we'll talk about how that looks, and especially of how that looks in Colossians. But it's important that we do that hard work so then we can teach the people more. Sometimes a series will run through the, the text of a New Testament book, Old Testament book, or part of that book. Oftentimes, I'll preach just a series on a couple chapters, sometimes maybe a whole book. But we look at those chunks and how they fit together. Now, like in Colossians, I think what we see is that Paul runs an argument all the way through the book. And the whole point of that is Jesus is what we need. We can be complete in Jesus. And the focus of that is chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Now, if we were to look at a book like 1 John, it's built a little bit different. I just finished preaching 1 John, and the whole point of the book of 1 John is you can know that you're in a right relationship with God. And John gives us several different tests that help us understand. So it, he says you need to have faith. You need to look and see if you're obeying God. You need to see if you have or love for other people. You need to see if you ever repent. Those things tell us whether we're in a right relationship with God. And, God, and John wanted his readers to know they were right with God. But here's the thing. John sort of circles through those tests multiple times in the letter. So it would be much more difficult to say, okay, we're just going to preach through the chapters of 1 John. You could do that easily with Colossians. But in 1 John, it's almost better to say, okay, let's talk about each individual test. And John may talk about it two, three, four times in the letter. So it becomes more topical than textual. We're still paying attention to scripture. We're never getting away from that. But ultimately, we're organizing our series based on the topics that John deals with. So there's more than one way to come at this. A series needs a, a purpose, a title, a structure. And all of those need to be in place if it's going to be an effective series. So we form the series. Then the next step is to choose the text. If it's a biblical sermon, it's got to have a biblical text. So we have to identify what the parameters of this are. And as we'll talk about in Colossians, and part of your assignment is going to be, okay, here's my series in Colossians, and here's how I'm breaking it down. So the first sermon is going to be based on these verses. The second sermon is going to be based on these verses. And that's part of putting together a series, but it's also part of putting together a sermon. And there are times when I may set up a series, then come to individual sermons and think, well, you know what? I need to look at this slightly different. I need to divide this up in a different way than I've thought before. Again, sometimes the idea 
is the thing that comes easy. And then we have to break it down and do the real study and figure out, okay, how is this going to work for preaching? But we've got to divide up the scripture into bites that people can understand and gain from, learn from in ways that will help them become stronger Christians. So uh, dividing up the text, choosing the text is part of the preparation for preaching. Let's think about study number two. After we identify the text and study it carefully, what we'll, I mean, we'll need to study it carefully, excuse me. I need to think about how this text is going to speak to the people. I, I might see that it's going to be divided in more than one sermon. I might find that we can only preach one segment of the text effectively. On the other hand, I might see that one text that I've chosen to preach on is informed by a larger context. And if I'm going to preach on this small piece, I've got to make sure that people understand the larger piece, or I'm really not being faithful to what Scripture has to say. We might study the text in any number of ways. And this is really some of the stuff that I enjoy the most, it is breaking this down and thinking through what are the parts that I need to study. Here are some things that you might need to study as you're preparing for a sermon and you're looking at the text that's going to be your text for that sermon. You might need to look at the cultural backgrounds, right? If Paul's talking about the relationship between men and women, what were the relationships between men and women like in the ancient world? If we're talking about how people understood the sacrificial system, well, we need to know what sacrifices look like in the temple in the Old Testament. All these things are cultural backgrounds that we've got to think through to understand what the Bible is actually saying. And there are works that help us with that, and we'll identify some of those. We also have to think about language, right? The languages of the Bible are not the languages that we speak in conversation. And so it helps to have some exposure to biblical languages, whether it's Hebrew, most of the Old Testament, Aramaic, a small amount in the Old Testament, or Greek in the New Testament. The whole New Testament is written in Greek. Anything that we can learn about those languages can be a benefit to us as we're studying for a particular sermon. We need to think about the context, and I mentioned that just a minute ago. To understand any one part of Scripture, we need to look at the larger context. What is that author trying to argue in this book, and how does this fit in? I think it's important for us as we study the text to identify the parts of it we just don't understand. It's good for us to say, I don't get this part. What do I need to do to understand it better? It's good for us to think about what is this text calling me to believe? What do I need to change about what I believe? And then what do I need to change about what I do, how I live my life? So what is this text calling me to do? So we're looking for what was the original author intending his original readers to believe, to know, what were they saying to them? And then in the rest of this process, we get to, what am I saying to my, my hearers? So all this that we're leading up to at this point is really about what was the original author saying to his original audience? And now sort of bring this down to one little point that we're going to talk about next. And then how do we broaden it back out? to our hearers. So the next thing is the main idea. From the beginning of the process, we've been moving from what does scripture say to this point? What is the central idea that I'm going to communicate in this message? What's the point? What do I want people to take away with them? Okay. They may remember your outline or they may not, but what do you want them to know? What do you want them to do once they finish listening to you on a Sunday morning or any other time you're speaking to them? Our goal is to take the intent of that original author and then communicate something of that in a way that people can understand it and live it. So this main idea takes some time to craft, but we'll have to put it in language that's easily memorable so we can remember it and so the people who are listening to us can remember it as well. So Crafting this main idea can take some time. And then we need to structure the sermon. Okay. We can structure a sermon in maybe not an infinite number of ways, but a lot of different ways. 
And various preachers do this in different ways, and that's okay. There's lots of analogies to describe this. We could think about an outline. So there's points to an outline. We may build them upon one another, or they may be sort of separate ideas. But a lot of times we think about a three-point sermon. So there are three things that we're trying to communicate. That's one way of going at it. And sometimes we use alliteration so that each point begins with the same letter. Sometimes we use some kind of rhyme. There's lots of ways to structure an outline, but an outline is one way to go at, this is what my sermon's going to look like. Some preachers think in terms of moves. Now, this may be a newer idea to you. My guess is you've thought about a sermon outline sometime before, but some preachers think in terms of moves. So it's like this. Let's just pretend we're on a journey with our listeners and we're in a specific place with them, right? We join where they are because we've got to start where they are, right? What they're thinking, what they're living, what they're asking, what they believe. And we're taking them on a journey to what the biblical writer wanted his readers, his listeners to know, right? We've identified that. We've spent time studying it. This is where the biblical writer is. This is where our people are. And we're going to take them on a journey from where they are to where the biblical writer is. And it's going to be a series of moves because we may not be able to jump them from right here to right there. Okay. So it's going to be a process of steps, moves from where they are to where the Bible is calling them to be. That's our job to think about what are the steps that they can take? How are they going to feel like Scripture has led them when it's all over? We'll come back to that. But again, that may be new, but it, it does make sense to think about what are the steps we can take to get people where Scripture wants them to go. Another way to think about preaching is to think about looking at one truth from multiple angles, because not everyone in our audience is going to think about it the same way. Plus, if we describe it in more than one way, that may help them see it in a better way. You can think about it like a precious stone, right? You got some precious stone that's been uh, uh, cut and it's been polished and it has multiple facets, multiple faces, maybe many different ones. And so you look at that stone from different directions and you see it sparkle in different ways. And in some ways we're finding a biblical truth and looking at it from multiple directions to see what the biblical writer was saying. For most of us, part of our goal is application. We're not just after, okay, we want our people to know something. We want them to take, take it and do something with it. In other words, we want them to live it out. So part of our goal is to apply scripture. Now this takes some creativity. Uh, we need to give ideas for what this is going to look like. And application really is a big part of our work as preachers to show people that God's word is lived, not just known. And so we might talk about how does this work in, in our families? How does this work in our professional lives and the work that we do for someone else? How does this work in our relationships? How does this work in, in how we take care of the things that God has given us? All those things can be part of application. Sermons got to have a beginning and an ending, right? If you just jump in and say, okay, in Romans chapter 11, this is what Paul said. That does not draw anyone in, right? You have to say, okay, this is where I am. Let me tell you something about how I didn't get this truth and how the Bible takes it and helps me understand the person God wants me to be. A good sermon will draw people in at the beginning, maybe with a story, maybe with a fact, okay? But it draws the person in and it will come to a meaningful end. If you just sort of stop mid-sentence, mid-thought, people are left thinking there's got to be more. So we want some, some uh, preachers talk about a landing, like in an airplane, right? You come in for a landing and you don't want to be too abrupt or you feel like you crashed. So you want to come in for a smooth landing and let people know what they can do with that scripture. And okay, now we're done. All right. So we need a good beginning and a good ending. The lack of a good introduction will keep people from running with us and moving with us. The lack of a good conclusion will leave people hanging, wondering if the sermon is really over. Illustrating. Now, this is a hard one because I'm not always good at this. In fact, this is one of my weaknesses. We need to show people what we're saying. And sometimes we show people 
by telling a story. A story makes things real. Now, sometimes it's a, an interesting fact. Sometimes it's a story from our own lives. Sometimes it's a story from somewhere else, maybe the news. Uh, sometimes we find good stories. But the truth is, many people will remember the stories you tell rather than the point that you made. So it will be, if you've not been preaching very long, you'll find this to be true, I'm almost certain, that people may come back to you weeks, months, maybe even years later and say, you remember when you told the story of whatever it is, something that happened with your son, your daughter, your spouse, your work, your whatever it may be, your, something, some game you play, and they'll remember that story, but they don't necessarily remember it the sermon itself, but maybe they learn something from the story that they'll take with them for a very long time. So illustrating is hugely important. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of work. It takes preparation. So spend some time illustrating. And then we get to writing. Now for me, I write my whole sermon out word for word. Now I'm not going to preach exactly those words and I'll talk about that. But I want to get the whole thing down. Now, lots of people do it different ways. There's not one way to do this. Some people write an extensive outline, right? They do it in outline form. And that's actually what I've done for these lectures. But for sermons, I write out a manuscript in paragraph form of everything that I want to say in that sermon. For me, that gets it out there and ready. For some people, it's more organized if it's in outline form. There are more than there is more than one way to do this. In fact, there's multiple ways to do this. But for me to get it all out, paragraph form is the best way to prepare for preaching. You will find something too. But for this class, I'm going to ask you to write a manuscript. And when we get to that assignment, I, and it's in your course outline, your course syllabus, it lays it out that I want a full manuscript before you do the preaching. So I want you to give that a try because I think it's a good discipline. And if you can get started in it early in your preaching, it will only help you. And then finally, we're actually going to deliver a sermon. Now, that was a whole lot of work before we ever get to the point of standing up in front of people and talking. Now, one thing we could sort of even add to this long list of things is that there is a place for preparation for actually preaching. But let's consider that part of delivery. For instance, for me, on a Sunday morning, our uh, church has two services. and But even before those two services, I get to the church early, basically before there's hardly anybody in the building, and I preach through my whole sermon. Okay, I, I get it out there because for me, preaching through that sermon the first time with nobody in the room is the best preparation for preaching it when the room is full. I will know my material far better if I've preached it already. So I get that done first thing on Sunday morning when I get to the building. And then when I get to my first service, I've already preached it. It's in my head and I'm ready to go. Now, we'll think about how do you deliver a sermon? What do you take with you? You take your Bible. What do you take with your Bible to the, the pulpit, the lectern that you're going to preach from? And some people will take that whole manuscript and read it. To me, that's hard to do and stay engaged with my audience. And so I take less. I take some notes. And that's one of the reasons that I preach through my sermon before Sunday morning or before I preach on Sunday morning, because I want to be as, as independent of my notes as possible. Okay? I don't really want to be looking at my notes when I'm preaching. I'd rather look at the people than my notes. So we'll talk through some tips for delivering a message really, really well. And again, it's not that I've got the one way to do this and every other way is wrong. But I think it's important, if at all possible, to stay as engaged with the listeners as, as, as we can. So this gives you an idea, right? Where we're going to go over the next few weeks. Remember that that our course is running in sort of two segments concurrently. So we're going to continue studying Colossians, right? We're going to walk through that verse by verse, but we're also going to walk through the process of preaching. And again, some of you have probably had some exposure to this, and it's my hope that it's not going to be too repetitive, but rather it's going to build on what you've heard before. I've had a number of different preaching professors over the years, and it's been a benefit to me
to have that. In fact, a, a quick story. One of my uh, preaching professors was a man named Bob Shannon. Uh, I had him at Emmanuel Christian Seminary when I was there, and the regular preaching professor was on sabbatical, so he had the year off. And Bob Shannon was there doing the preaching classes, and he was a great preacher, still is. And uh, it was interesting because when I visited what was Zimbabwe Christian College, uh, in the room where we stayed, there was a big sort of... Uh, chest, you know, with doors on the front. And on top of this chest was a box. And I thought, well, I wonder what's in that box. So I pulled it down. And what do you know? It was some cassette tapes. You know what that is. They're old. And on those cassette tapes was sermons from Bob Shannon. And he preached at the church where I was preaching at that time, many years before I did. He was one of my predecessors, uh, before he was even a professor. Pulled that down, and there are preaching tapes from Bob Shannon. So I learned a lot from Bob and I hope, you know, his class was very different from some of the other homiletics classes I had. So it's my hope that as we go through this, even if you've learned some of this, I'll be able to add to some things that maybe someone else has taught you because none of us have this perfect. And you'll learn some things from different ones that'll be a benefit. I've picked up lots of things over the years from different preaching professors that have helped me along the way, along with reading about preaching. So let me encourage you to do that. In your course outline, you'll see some things that are listed that are resources for preaching. And if you can pick those up in the library along the way and read them as you're, I know you're busy, but as you can get opportunity, the more you read about preaching, the better preacher you're going to be. So there's our map, right? That's our roadmap for what we're going to talk about in our uh, lectures on preaching. And so we'll get started in some of the specifics later, but that tells you where we're going to go. And I'll talk with you more when we gather again.